this evening's speaker, John Michael J. Okay, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, John comes to us tonight from uh, pretty close to the area we just visited, although not 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 exactly. He graduated from the University of New Orleans with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Communications and from Southeastern Louisiana University with a Master of Arts in History. He currently works in New Orleans, leading historic tours of his hometown and helping residents and visitors appreciate the city's best. Do you work for yourself or work for someone else, or how do you do that? I work for several companies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he's also a board game designer, and according to the uh, newsletter, concentrating on the period of Western war from warfare from 1685 to 1866. That's right. 1685. Yeah, Battle of Sedgemore. Okay. But, yeah, that's a long time. Okay. And his publications include the Battle of Petersburg, June 15th to 18th, 1864, uh, published by the Roman Books, 2015. Uh, Rants left Cook. The Bermuda Hundred campaign, May five to June seven. <coughs> Something uh, will be anyway. Eighteen sixty four. I said it was in twenty eleven, twenty twenty one. Right. Okay. Tonight, however, uh, his last book is entitled <coughs> "Dreams of Victory." General P. G. D. Beauregard. In the Civil War, Sabbath meeting 2022, fairly recent, right? Some of us have them, uh, and if you don't, they're uh, about to be more for sale back there. They're available. And Dan has probably heard it before, but he is waiting back there to sell books. Anyway, I will tell you that I have been looking forward to this since I learned that uh, this is what uh, Sean is going to speak on. Because I think that Beauregard is one of the more interesting Civil War figures, and yet is rarely a subject of one of our presentations. So, Sean, um, please come up and tell us about Pierre Starr, Hutan, Beauregard. Tell him a name like that. Guy's got to be interesting. Yeah. All right. So first thing, <clears throat> first things first. Everybody hears me fine. Excellent, everybody. Um, of course, you already got his full name there. He's a Creole. I'm mentioning that real quick though because I do want to say something that may sound like a long name to you, but I want to give you one longer. Jean Bernard Philippe Xavier de Merny de Mandeville. Now that's one hell of a Creole name. <laughs> so. So Beauregard comes from, a, uh, comes from an area where his name would not be considered unusual. Southeast Louisiana, an area dominated at that time that he's born in 1818 by Creoles. Although it's an area in transition because the Americans had bought it. That's an important thing to keep in mind about this man. We're talking about somebody who comes from a part of America that is not like the rest of the country. Predominantly at that time, Catholic, French speaking, and like I said, a Creole. Now that's a controversial term. It means something different if you're a linguist. It means something different if you're in the Caribbean. But I would say, here's the definition I give people. They like this one. For, Louis, for Southeast Louisiana, is anybody of French, Spanish, and or West African descent who was maintaining the colonial traditions of Louisiana and, and was, um, whose ancestors came there when it was a colony. And so he is born to a family that is one of the founding families of Louisiana with a long uh, line of military service. And that's very important early on because Beauregard very early on takes interest not in the plantation that he grows up on, but in the military. Now, one, one of my favorite stories about him is that at one of his birthday parties, they gifted him a musket that was captured by one of the British soldiers in the Battle of New Orleans. And as everybody's lined up there to go uh, give him uh, well wishes and say happy birthday, he's instead too busy off firing the musket. And another one, he was at St. Louis Cathedral, and the military marching band went by, and he ran out the cathedral to go follow them. So naturally, of course, he already has an interest in the military. His father notes that. And one of the first controversies of his, of his life is when his father is deciding where he's going to go to school. And understand, a lot of these Creoles at this time hated the Americans. And I say this because if you go to the train station in New Orleans, 
they have this really, uh, really striking piece of WPA art that surrounds a train station, which is the history of New Orleans all the way into about the 1930s. We got, my favorite panel, though, is when the Louisiana Purchase happens. And New Orleans goes from being owned by Napoleon to being owned by America. And as the U.S. flag is going up, one half is cheering and happy, and the other half is going, oh, my God, we can't believe this happened. Well, part of his family feels exactly that way, especially his grandfather and his mother's side. He wants him to go to school in Paris or somewhere in France, like a lot of the Creole families are doing at the time. But his father says, no, we're owned by America. He must go to an American school. The compromise is that he goes to a school in New York that has to be run by two Napoleonic War veterans, one of whom had won a medal that had personally been pinned on his chest by Napoleon after the Battle of Austerlitz. And Beauregard hears these stories of Napoleon. He's obsessed with him. When he comes back home, he starts reading about all of his campaigns and decides that he wants a military career. His father uses his political connections and the fact that one of his ancestors had actually helped out the Americans during the revolution to get him an appointment to West Point. Now, a lot of Civil War generals have fun, interesting stories about at West Point or other officers and recollections. You'll find almost none of that for Beauregard. It appears in West Point, he was somewhat shy and withdrawn. We have a few little anecdotes here and there, but nothing too considerable, really. That said, he did graduate second in his class, posted to the engineers. And another thing, too, throughout the 1840s, especially the 1850s, Beauregard is really lucky because a lot of these officers got posted to places they really didn't want to be. A really dramatic example is this, says Grant. He was sent out west, away from his family. That's one of the reasons why he starts drinking when he does. Or Robert E. Lee. He wasn't at home very much. He's being sent all over America to oversee major engineering projects. Beauregard, though, is posted to southeast Louisiana, where all of his friends and family are. I got to say, he, I gotta say, he really should count his blessings on that one. But the thing that really makes him stand out, besides the fact he's an excellent engineer, is his service during the Mexican War. Now, he was not part of the initial battles that Zachary Taylor fought, but he is then posted to Winfield Scott's engineering company, which, of course, included Robert E. Lee, George McClellan, and a variety of other future Civil War generals. Lee and uh, Beauregard, in particular, did a lot of the scouting work for Scott throughout the campaign. He did excellent in Mexico. Battle Sierra Gordo finds the way to outflank the Mexican position. The Battle of Contreras, he also finds a way to make a path through the lava bed that allows him to win the battle. Such was how well he did that battle that actually his father renamed their plantation from Tutant Nord to Conteras, which is what it's known as today. But the big one comes at Chapultepec. This is when the American army is trying to figure out how do you storm Mexico City? And they had done scouting around the city for days. And most of the officers, when Scott is having his council of war, say attack from the south. Beauregard was quiet throughout. Scott eventually asked him to speak up. And he said, if you attack them there, they know you're going to come from there because it's the weakest spot. And even then, it's a tough defensive position. He says, attack the fortress of Chapultepec. They will not expect you. And that's what they did. And Beauregard played a leading part in the storming of Chapultepec and the storming of Mexico City. So understand, this is a man who leaves the Mexican campaign. He gets a promotion. He is highly regarded. But he's not content with this. We have to understand that this is a man of, of a lot of ambition and highly, highly intelligent, usually the smartest man in the room, which doesn't always make you the easiest person to work with. Yeah. Now, he, he got a lot of accolades, but he openly said, I did not get as many as I deserved. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's a great memoir that he wrote that T. Harry Williams in the 1950s edited and published called, with, now it's renamed with Beauregard, Mexico. And it's a great account of the campaign, but it's a lot of complaining. <laughs> that he's not getting enough credit. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a distinguishing feature of him, unfortunately. But excellent account of the campaign. But then you start to see that he is, like I said, a man of ambition and a man who feels that he is not getting his due. And this is going to play a major part in the reason he is not going to be as successful in the Civil War. Now, that's it. 1850s, be fair to Beauregard. There is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of problems that he has. For one thing, His first wife died while giving childbirth to his daughter. So he has that tragedy to deal with. Promotion, of course, is slow in the army. He felt that he had not received the accolades he deserved for Mexico and actually considered going up to Nicaragua with William Walker. He was convinced and talked out of it. Oh, yeah. One of the men who wrote a letter to him, I forget the name escapes right now, but wrote a letter saying, look, Walker is uh, 
is essentially an immoral buccaneer and, and you are way more competent than he is. This endeavor will fail and it did. Another big one was he decided to dabble his toes in politics, running for mayor of New Orleans in 1858. And understand New Orleans politics in the 1850s is in many ways defined by violence. Both political parties would use gangs to attack the opposing party. Election day was considered one of, if not the most dangerous day in New Orleans at that time. Yeah. And actually, there was almost a, it was almost a street fight between two rival militias in New Orleans during the 1858 election. That violence was voided. Beauregard actually, if anything, said, I had a sigh of relief when I did not get elected. <laughs> that's something to, <laughs> that's something to keep in mind, too. The failure that he has in that election, another one I want to point out, too, is what happened during the 1852 election. Now, Franklin Pierce is running against Winfield Scott. Pierce and Beauregard got along very well during Mexico. One of the reasons is because when Beauregard first said, let's attack Chapultepec, Pierce was the man who stood up and said, I agree with him. And so Beauregard, of course, is like, ah, this man knows genius when he sees it, right? <laughs> but of course, it helps he's a fellow Democrat, you know? So you have to consider this. He openly backs Pierce, who was against Scott. Scott is the head of the army at the time. Beauregard is looking for promotion. This is politically not very shrewd. <laughs> Now, to Scott's credit, Scott, as far as you can tell, never actually held that against Beauregard, that he back, openly backed Franklin Pierce. And so 1882 election, that actually did work to Beauregard's advantage. You got a posting overseeing the Customs House in New Orleans. But that being said, that should be kept in mind that Beauregard is not the best at a politics. He was lucky in 1852 that Scott didn't take that personally, because Jefferson Davis is going to take some things personally when the Civil War does happen. Now, Another indicator of that is in 1860. By that time, Beauregard had married a second time, Caroline Delon, who is tied to several prominent New Orleans families, in particular, Senator John Slidell. But even in the 1850s in Louisiana, politics was considered particularly corrupt, if that tells you anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was adept at stealing votes. He was very good at this. Slidell, but he had a lot of political allies. Slidell's a big one, though. They're able to secure for Beauregard a position as superintendent of West Point. Now, you would imagine this is 1860. The talk of secession is in the air. Beauregard's letters at that time indicate that he doesn't think anything will happen. He's also convinced that the president will not be Abraham Lincoln, but it'll be John C. Breckinridge. This man's abilities of politics are not very good. Well, 1861, in January 1861, he leaves New Orleans to go to New York City to become superintendent of West Point. Now, there's an argument made that and T.R. Williams made this argument that maybe he would just want to puff up his resume. I think Beauregard genuinely thought that a war would be avoided. And maybe he'd be able to be in charge of West Point. It didn't last long, though. He was in charge of West Point for three days. <laughs> Nobody's been shorter. <laughs> now, when he returns to Louisiana, he actually suffers another blow. He is not posted as commander of Louisiana's state troops. It is Braxton Bragg. That's because Bragg is friendly with Thomas Overton Moore, the governor of Louisiana, and Bragg was an open, fire-eating secessionist. Now, understand, Beauregard thinks secession is legal and fine, doesn't have a problem with it, but he is not a fire-eater. He was not arguing, let's secede right now. He would have said secession's fine, but not at the moment. Bragg had the opposite opinion. Moore favored that. Beauregard feels insulted, so he joined the Orleans Guard Battalion. It's a unit made up of elite Creole, so essentially a unit of his friends and family, and he joined them as a private. Now, of course, he's not going to be private for long. It's just a way to show solidarity with his friends and family. A few days later, though, Jefferson Davis and Senator, Secretary of War Leroy Pope Walker call up Beauregard to Montgomery, Alabama, to discuss, to advise on what to do with Fort Sumter in Charleston. They very quickly, Beauregard gains the confidence of both men. At this point, him and Davis are getting along just fine. And he is now kind of the unofficial advisor to Walker. They will put him at Charleston to oversee the situation in Fort Sumter, which Beauregard handled superbly. This might be one of his good political moments. He actually got along really well to Charleston elite. But he wrote in his uh, letters, I see them as, look, as being the same as the Creoles. So right man for the job in that regard. Handled the situation well, placed his artillery well, and of course, Fort Sumter fell. At that point, Beauregard is one of the most famous people in America. And understandably so, he is given command of the largest Confederate army. That's the one posted in Virginia at Manassas Junction. Now, Beauregard, of the lead up to Bull Run, is able to convince them to bring Josephine Johnston's force in the Shenandoah Valley by railroad over. 
That's important to keep in mind. Beauregard was one of the first officers to really see the potential of the railroad, not just to move troops around long distances, but actually to move them operationally on a battlefield to gain an immediate advantage. Now, when the actual battle starts, Beauregard concocts all these plans to attack the Federals. Those plans fail because Beauregard's staff is really bad at this time. I want to be fair to him. Everybody's staff is bad right now. If anything, what he can be faulted for is trying to pull off complicated maneuvers with a staff that's just not up to the task. That's what you could fault him for. Regardless, everybody's got bad staff work. Well, his forces are outflanked. Union attacks. They shatter several brigades. Beauregard rides over to the flank with Johnston and rallies the troops, reforms the lines, orders a series of counterattacks that at first fail, but they do put the Federals off kilter and then orders the last attack that drives them off and the routed bull runs. So understand that at this point, Beauregard has won the largest and bloodiest battle that any American army has ever been involved in at that point. He is now the most celebrated general in the country, the Confederacy's premier hero. People are naming their children after him. He's getting letters and from people all over the South, especially women. And he is very popular. And here's where things really hurt for him, I would say. Jefferson Davis is going to decide who his top-ranking Confederate generals are. Number one, will be Samuel Cooper, because he's the adjutant general. He's the guy who sends out the orders. He's not a field commander, though. He's just in Richmond. The field commander, the highest ranking one, is Albert Sidney Johnston, Jefferson Davis's favorite general and his ideal of what a man is. Third, Robert E. Lee. Fourth, Joseph E. Johnston. Fifth, Beauregard. Beauregard is below Joseph E. Johnston. As far as Beauregard's concerned, He's the one who won Bull Run. Not that he had a good relationship with Johnson. He gave Johnson credit. But as far as he's concerned, he's the one who won the battle. Why is he given a lesser rank? This makes Beauregard, understandably, I'd say, upset. I'd say even worse than that is that Beauregard, because he got along well with Johnson, actually, he was, I'd say, late 1861. He's still relatively happy, but things get worse and worse as it goes on. For one thing, all the plans he submits to Johnston and to Davis are turned down. Most of those plans involve invading the North. Those plans are turned down. The other one, too, is that Davis's growing political critics and enemies start attaching their name to Beauregard. Now, Beauregard, we don't have any evidence that he's trying to that he has that he's trying to orchestrate something with Davis's political critics. They're just using him as a way to attack Davis, saying this man has not received the accolades he deserves. This man does not attain the rank that he deserves. And Davis notices that. And then Beauregard gets into a squabble with Davis's Secretary of War, Judah P. Benjamin. And when Davis tries to get Beauregard to make up with Benjamin, Beauregard refuses. And that's around the time of the appellation, your friend is missing from every letter that Jefferson Davis sends him from here on out. That is gone. Now, keep it in mind, Jefferson Davis, at this point, still thinks highly of Beauregard as a military commander. He just doesn't like him personally. And he also notices that his political opponents are seem to be big fans of this. Now, one other thing, Beauregard asked to be sent to New Orleans to oversee its defenses. That was turned down. I think that's an interesting what if for the Civil War, only because Beauregard understood those defenses better than anybody else. And in fact, actually essentially told them exactly how the Union was going to take the city anyway. But that's for a different story. Point is, he see, it feels like he's being wasted in Virginia. And then... In January of 1862, George Thomas wins a battle at Mill Springs. Small battle compared to what happens later, but very important strategically, turns the Confederate position in the West. And also, the army that was defeated at Mill Springs, the Confederate force defeated at Mill Springs, was shattered, routed from the field. So it's a humiliating defeat. So to boost morale and to give Albert Sidney Johnston, who's the commander out there, some assistance, Davis asks Beauregard if he'll go West, and he agrees. Now, going West, everywhere he goes, he is greeted and cheered by crowds. I mean, remember, this is the South's premier military hero, and no doubt about it, he is a charismatic man who cuts a fine figure with his excellently tailored uniforms and fine black hair, which actually his hair is turning white, but, you know, he's a vain Louisianian. You know, you got to keep your hair not white, right? <laughs> hey, Edgar, hey, his hair goes white later in the war because in the blockade, they can't get the hair dye in, you know? <laughs> but at any rate, though, he consults with Joseph Albertson e. Johnson, and very soon after, Fort Henry falls. Fort Donaldson is under threat. Now, at that point, Johnson decides to send Beauregard to West Tennessee, where Confederate forces are being pulled from all over the South to concentrate 
to face the Union. This is one of Beauregard's finest hours. Remember, he understood the use of railroads before most other generals. So he's pulling men from all over the place, organizing a defense. Robertson E. Johnson's army leaves Kentucky, marches through Nashville, and eventually to Corinth, Mississippi, where the armies concentrate. Now, at that point, Johnson offered Beauregard command of the forces. Why is controversial? Beauregard, of course, turned him down. He will now be second in command to a different Johnston. Within a few days of that concentration, which was in late March 1862, they decide they have to attack Ulysses Grant's army, which is at Pittsburgh Landing. And they have to before the Union Army of the Ohio, led by Don Carlos Buell, can arrive to reinforce Grant. Because at that point, they will have a crushing numerical advantage. Now, to make the attack that Johnston agrees to, he leaves up to Beauregard and is particularly his uh, chief of staff, Thomas Jordan, to draw the plans up. And this is one of Beauregard's biggest failures in the Civil War, is right now, because they decide to have a complicated plan of march. This is through rough terrain over bad roads during a time when it was actually really, really raining. There was more rain in March and April of 1862 in that area than on average, one of the rainiest seasons that area has actually ever seen. So that makes the bad roads even worse. And you've got troops who they have done some marching, but not this kind of marching, where you're marching up to get into a battle, where time is of the essence. And so the march is delayed. They're supposed to attack on April 5th, 1862, but they can't. They're going to have to attack on April 6th. At that point, Beauregard advised Johnston to turn back, do not attack the Federals at Pittsburgh Landing. He said they would be entrenched to the eyes. There's no way they can't know that we're here. But Johnston, of course, said, I would fight them if they were a million. Beauregard tried to convince him again later that night. Again, he failed. And in the morning of April, 8, of April 6, 1862, the first thing Beauregard does is arrive right, at Johnston and say, we shouldn't attack. But then the sound of gunfire is heard off in the distance. The Battle of Shiloh has begun. Now, Beauregard is second in command, but Albert Sidney Johnston will go up to the front to lead the troops personally in several attacks while Beauregard will oversee the movement of troops in the rear, particularly reinforcements. Now, this has an effect on both men. In the case of Albert Sidney Johnston, while he does lead some successful, successful attacks, he will die in battle and die after leading one particularly successful assault. The effect that had on Beauregard was by the time he found, Johnston, found out Johnston was dead and that he was supposed to command, he had a pretty good handle on where his units were and what was going on. So he can assume command almost right away. And except for one part of the battlefield, there really is no lull at Shiloh. Confederates continue to push on. They will capture a number of federal soldiers in the famous Hornet's Nest and then push the rest of the army towards Dill Branch area at Pittsburgh Landing. Now, interesting ringtone. <laughs> yeah, wait, that way, that ringtone is perfectly placed. This is when the Confederates think they're winning. <laughs> It'll, of course, be uh, Beauregard, of course, forces the line to attack. The problem is the Federals have gunboats nearby. They're firing into their forces. Now, the gunboats don't cause a lot of casualties, but those cannons are loud. And if you did happen to see somebody hit by a cannon from a gunboat, it's particularly gruesome. So certain Confederate units were like, oh, it was a lot of noise. Other ones were like, no, it was kind of horrifying, and we were stunned. It depends on who's getting hit. But also, Grant had all these cannons lined up. Now, he's spent on infantry. Most, a lot of his men were broken down. Many had run away. He's spent on infantry. He's got a lot of cannons, and the terrain is very rough as well. And the Confederates themselves are exhausted, low on ammunition. And the attack, the attack is fairly easily driven off, and then Beauregard calls off the assault. Now, this becomes a ten of the lost cause afterwards, the idea that if Albertson and Johnson had lived, they would have driven them right into the river. And I don't believe that. Most historians now don't. However, I will add, I think the decisive factor is the sunset. Because think about it, maybe a few more hours, they can find a weakness in the line, not along Dill Branch, but somewhere else. Grant's line is not perfect by any means. A lot of his men are thoroughly rattled. Nothing's for certain. However, attacking at that particular time of day, at the particular terrain they're attacking, when they're attacking, that is not going to work. And most of the men agreed at that time. Now, one mistake people will say is that Beauregard should have kept his men closer to Grant's lines. That way he could take advantage of defensive terrain. Problem with that is those gunboats are firing right near your men. And also, one of Beauregard's primary objectives for attacking Grant at Shiloh, he straight up says it is, we're going to loot their camp. It's 
So he had the men fall back to where the camps are to thoroughly loot them. And loot them they will, including men marching on the battlefield, putting cheese wedges on their bayonets. <laughs> but here comes another thing that really, really is going to hurt Beauregard. See, he's thinking the next day we'll finish Grant off. But what about Buell? Remember, they're attacking to get there before Buell. Ah, but that night, they receive a message from Colonel Benjamin Helm of the 1st Kentucky Cavalry that says, Buell's not coming to Grant, he's going to Alabama. <laughs> now, what had actually happened was where Zombie Mitchell, famous astronomer, had led a reinforced division into Alabama. The other thing that happened was, on the march to Shiloh, Buell had his cavalry and infantry fan out to force the Confederate cavalry away. So they lost contact with them in early April 1862. They didn't know where the main column was. The column they do detect is not the main column. So armed with that, Beauregard and his men are like, we're going to win this now. The whole time this is happening, Buell's army of the Ohio is being brought over. And those steamers, they're blowing steam. And you'd think maybe they would think, oh, they're getting reinforcements. No, they, many of them assume that was Grant retreating. Now, if I was a fault Beauregard for anything in particular at Shiloh, it would be around 9, 10 a.m. on April 7th, 1862, because the Federals attacked almost right away, just as dawn happens. Federals are pushing forward. And Beauregard's reaction to that wasn't, well, they're attacking me. Maybe they have more men, or maybe they've rallied sufficiently. His reaction is, no, I'll just go attack them right away. And those attacks are poorly coordinated. They lead to heavy losses. And his men, who are already themselves, have gone through an intense experience. Our, many of those regiments are shattered, never to be seen again during the battle. But by noon, Beauregard knows that he's facing Grant reinforced by Buell and Lew Wallace. He knows that there is no way to win this battle. And here is where he actually has one of his finest moments. He realizes that retreating at this moment, his army could be scattered. So he orders a series of counterattacks to put the Union forces off balance, and that works. It gets really desperate by 2 p.m because there's so few Confederates on the battle line. At this point, almost every general who's around is in the front, holding flags, rallying men, directing attacks. You know, we like to think of guys like Braxton Bragg and Daniel Ruggles as being really unpopular, but this is actually these moments where there's soldiers right glowingly about them because they're in the front lines right there with them. Bragg himself directing cannons at a certain point. Well, Beauregard himself led several attacks, one of which was the Orleans Guard Battalion. You gotta think at this moment, he is leading that unit forward, that unit I mentioned earlier, made up of friends of family, right into an assault. But of course he did. And when he gave the order to attack, naturally, he gave it in French. <laughs> <laughs> These attacks work. The army is able to retreat back to Corinth. Now, something else had happened the night of April 6th, 1862. In addition to thinking Buell's not on the way, Bra Beauregard sent a message to Jefferson Davis where he gives him two pieces of news. One. Johnston is dead. Two, we have won a great victory. And so Davis, an elated, sad that Johnston's dead, but elated the victory, tells Confederate Congress, and they personally thanked Beauregard for winning Shiloh. Now, let's put ourselves in Jefferson Davis's shoes after Shiloh. You find out, actually, we've lost this major battle. I've been embarrassed by having the Confederate Congress thank you for losing. And the commander who I considered my number one man is dead. And the replacement is you. And not only that, but from what I can tell, he died right at the moment the Federals were being driven back. And we started, in his mind, he's thinking, we started losing the moment you took over. And this is the moment where Davis starts to have a low opinion of Beauregard as a general. The only thing he'll have a high opinion of him as is as an engineer. Now, that problem comes in. Beauregard handled the siege of Corinth very well. Ultimately, there was no general was going to hold Corinth. The Federals, besides outnumbering him significantly, Halleck's strategy, which it's been criticized thoroughly, but let's think about it. The fact that they inched inch by inch and entrenched meant that there was really no easy way to attack Halleck and drive him off. And so Halleck at least guarantees that he's going to take Corinth. Now, Beauregard did try to attack him twice. He tried to rely on Earl Van Dorn's force to do it. Earl Van Dorn, though, probably has the worst staff in either army, so that doesn't work. <laughs> And Beauregard evacuates Corinth. At this point, decides to take a medical leave unasked for. Put myself in, put yourself in Beauregard's shoes. This is an exhausted man who has just led troops in the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Civil War, a battle that he was convinced he was going to win almost up until the last moment. 
And not just that, he did all of this during this in bad health. Before going out west, he had a throat surgery. Corinth itself is, has a, is got known for its terrible water. Uh, Sam Watkins essentially said, there was no place I was happier to leave than Corinth, Mississippi. Sam Watkins, of course, famous for his account as a Confederate soldier. So, uh, so Beauregard, he's in bad health. And, but he didn't ask for the medical leave. Now, he hadn't taken it yet. Davis found out about it and then promptly removes him from command. Now, Beauregard spends a few months not really doing much. Eventually, he is sent to Charleston, South Carolina. And this is done partially because the South Carolina politicians want him. They like Beauregard. And Davis understood, once again, that Beauregard was a good engineer. So as far as he was concerned, Charleston's the perfect assignment for his abilities, and it'll make the South Carolina politicians happy. Now, Beauregard's handling of the defense of Charleston is one of the highlights of his career. Building the entrenchments, actually setting up the naval guns and torpedoes that would help repel the Union monitors when they attacked Charleston, and the way that he handled the entire defense. Brilliantly done. Uh, and Charleston holds. And this is very important, too, because if you look at 1863, this is the only actual strategic Confederate victory of that year. Chancellorsville and Chickamauga were tactical victories, but the follow-up to those is Gettysburg and Chattanooga, which are definitely defeats. Pemberton surrenders at Vicksburg, Port Hudson Falls. The only place where the Confederates actually succeeded was at Charleston. So once again, Beauregard is popular. And that's why in April of 1864, Davis is forced to give him another major command, this time in charge of the troops assigned to defend Richmond and Petersburg. Not a backwater. The Federals are going to mount a major effort to take those places. In the early 1864, the Army of the James, led by Benjamin Butler, who, of course, Beauregard can't wait to face because Butler had occupied New Orleans, so he saw this as a personal vendetta. Bermuda Hunter campaign, very, very complicated campaign. Ultimately, Beauregard is successful over Butler. He wins the Battle of Drury's Bluff. Drury's Bluff, though, wasn't like a great victory for Beauregard. Uh, in many ways, you could argue that he won that because the Federals kind of gave up. Also, the Union high command during the campaign is a shambles. But to Beauregard's credit, he understood exactly what he had to do. And I would give him a lot of credit for the follow-up battle afterwards, the Battle of Warebottom Church. That's a battle they attack Butler's forward positions and drive him even further into the Bermuda Hunter Peninsula. So this is a victory, no doubt about it. And Beauregard is once again popular. He is rewarded with this by having his troops taken away from him to reinforce Robert E. Lee. Hey, understandably so. Lee desperately needs the men. But all Beauregard's plans that he sends to Davis and Lee about how they need to combine their forces and strike here and strike there, all of them are turned down. So once again, you have a frustrated general who once again finds himself in command of what looks like a backwater. That is until June 15, 1864. By that time, Grant and Meade had swung away from Richmond and decided to go for Petersburg. Robert E. Lee does not detect the movement. There's a lot of reasons for that. One is, I would say, Lee himself is in poor health, and his morale is shot, because Lee's whole thing was keep them away from Richmond, and you can sleep well at night. Well, now they're at Richmond, where McClellan was, and he knows that now it's only a question of time. His morale is low. But in addition to that, most of his cavalry was away. And so they couldn't find where Grant was. Grant and Meade are striking for Petersburg. Now, the attack on Petersburg on June 15th, the Confederates are able to, they, the main defensive line falls, but the city doesn't fall. Beauregard arrives that night with reinforcements, sets his men up in defensive positions, and they will hold out on June 16th. The night of June 16th, Beauregard makes a decision, one of the boldest of the war, one of the boldest tactical decisions of the war, which is, I will take part of my troops and set up a defensive line behind the line I already have. And keeping in mind, he does not have a lot of men. The Federals significantly outnumber him. So this is a risk. But he knows that his, the line he now holds, he cannot hold permanently. He needs a better line. Uh, June 17th, the Federals attacked him three times. One of those attacks actually pierces the line, almost breaks his right flank. And that night, Beauregard makes the decision that we have to fall back to the second line in the middle of the night. And we're talking about with men, many of whom have been in combat for days. This is a daring, gutsy move to do this at night. And it's pulled off almost without a hitch, having 15,000 men fall back to a new defensive line. When the Federals attack in the morning, they are stunned to find that the Confederates are gone. And they didn't even pick up that many prisoners, only a few hundred. So this is pulled off brilliantly. Now that last defensive line, eventually Lee at that point arrives, reinforces it, 
The Federal's attack it makes several uncoordinated attacks, all leads to its heavy casualties. And with that, Petersburg holds. And this is a major strategic victory. D. Harry Williams said it was Beauregard's best battle. I would have to agree. Probably one of the finest tactical showings that any general had during the Civil War. Anyway, Beauregard's reward is Jefferson Davis wants to call a court of inquiry over him moving troops from Bermuda 100 to Petersburg. This court of inquiry goes nowhere. And even some of Davis's friends said this is embarrassing now. At this point, though, Beauregard will now found himself second in command to Robert E. Lee. So there you go. He's been second in command to both Johnston's and Lee. Now, in the Petersburg situation, Beauregard's record is afterwards a, a bit mixed. He is frustrated being underneath Lee, although he, he respected Lee. They had a complicated relationship going all the way back to Mexico. He would always freely admit that Lee was talented, but I think Beauregard felt that he was better. But that being said, um, one of his bad showings, he launched an attack on the federal lines on June 24th, 1864. That failed. It was a complicated plan. One of his better showings is at the crater, uh, because before the crater, before the crater attack happened, Beauregard had created other defensive lines behind the main line, not a complete line, but other defensive positions, and it also given standing orders to all the regiments on what to do if the lines are pierced at any moment. And he was the first guy on the spot there as well, though Lee arrived soon afterwards. So not a major contributor to the victory, of the victory at the crater, but one that deserves some note. And then came the Battle of Globe Tavern. This was fought just south of Petersburg, and the Confederates attacked three times. The first two attacks were stunning successes. The third one was a failure. And Jefferson Davis afterwards is livid. Now, Lee tries to defend Beauregard as best he can, but essentially says, we should probably send him somewhere else. He's obviously frustrated being here. Now, at this moment, Atlanta has fallen. And there's a call to remove John Bell Hood. Now, keep this in mind. All throughout 1863 and 1864, whenever Jefferson Davis is thinking about replacing somebody in the Army of Tennessee, he'll inevitably write a letter to Robert E. Lee asking, who do you think? And Robert E. Lee almost all the time says, put Beauregard in command, then Davis says no. <laughs> Same thing here. Not exactly with Lee, though, but other, other generals like Richard Taylor and other ones are telling him, why don't you put Beauregard in command? And uh, he doesn't. He'll keep Hood. Yeah, keep in mind, Davis at one point said, if God came down and asked me to put Beauregard in command, I would tell God no. <laughs> but to mollify the people of the South, because they're looking at Beauregard and being like, hey, he actually wins battles. He should have something. He's made commander of the Western Department, which means he gets to shuffle around troops by railroad and logistics. It's an important job, but not one entirely befitting his talents. And while Hood leads his army north into Tennessee to get destroyed at Franklin and Nashville, Beauregard will have one of the most thankless tasks of the Civil War. He'll be the one in charge of trying to defend against Sherman's march on Savannah and then into the Carolinas. Of course, eventually he is replaced with Joseph E. Johnston. This guy can't help but be underneath a guy's name, Johnston. In some ways, this one's more humiliating than the other ones, though, because Joseph E. Johnston, when he sees Beauregard, he doesn't say, oh, you should hang out with me. He says, no, stay in the rear and funnel troops and supplies to me. Ah, there's the Battle of Bentonville. You know, Johnston's defeated. And then Beauregard actually wrote up to the army and said, hey, you need, you need help rallying the troops? And understand, Beauregard, he's great at battlefield charisma, at rallying men. And Johnston said, no, go back to the rear. <laughs> but his last service to Confederacy is when Jefferson Davis had a conference with Johnston, Beauregard, and other generals to discuss keeping the war going even after. Robert E. Lee has surrendered. Johnson continuously argues against it. And at a certain point, Davis asked Beauregard, what do you think? And he said, I concur with Johnston. And as the account goes, at that point, Davis's shoulders slumped and he moved out of the room a defeated man. What Beauregard said about that was, game to the last, but how blind. Now, after this, Beauregard makes his way back to New Orleans. His career after the Civil War and during Reconstruction is Really one of the more fascinating ones for a Civil War general. And, of course, is filled with lots of achievement and frustration. For one thing, he was an executive to two different railroads. He saved both of them, made them very successful. And he was ousted from both railroads. Oh, he got involved in politics. Very early on, he was an advocate for equal rights for the former slaves, equal civil and voting rights. Anytime he would advocate for this, he would then get a storm of criticism from a lot of other people, especially other fellow Confederates. 
And that meant that he backed down each time. Now, eventually in 1876, during those elections, he backed a series of moderate uh, candidates on race. One of them was Randall Lee Gibson, who had led a brigade at Shiloh. Uh, Gibson and Beauregard then had a falling out because Beauregard then decided to become associated with the Louisiana Lottery. Now, in his mind, he's trying to get money for his family. This is important to him, right? But he's involved in a corrupt institution. Most people knew he wasn't corrupt, but think about it. That means that he is either willfully blind to the corruption or he knows better and is just looking the other way because he's getting paid. Either way, Beauregard's reputation took a heavy hit due to the Louisiana Lottery. And he lost political allies like Randall Lee Gibson, men who had, would eventually actually turn out and become in favor of things that Beauregard opposed, such as segregation. So there you go, a political failure. And while he did make money for his family, this definitely tarnished his reputation. And then there was the whole battle with people like Davis and Joseph E. Johnston to try to you know, set the record straight in his favor with his memoirs, all two volumes of them. Hey, I want to give, hey, I want to give credit to his memoirs. He wrote them along with Alfred Roman. They are not a great read, okay? Not a great read, but I'll give him credit on this. Compared to some other memoirs, they're more accurate than most. I'm not saying rely on them for everything, but, uh, you know, I think, um, I got to be honest, I think uh, Ulysses S. Grant and John Gordon are ones you need to be a lot more careful with than Beauregard's. The Beauregard at least, like, quoted extensively from uh, original sources and threw them in there. So I give him credit on that. Really good historical source, but don't read them for, for pleasure. You're just doing yourself pain, all right? That being said, his attempts to increase his reputation, these ultimately didn't work, not only because the memoirs are poorly written, but because these squabbles didn't look good. And also he made his own, I wouldn't say underhanded, but he made his own kind of um, passive aggressive attacks on Lee, especially about Petersburg. I think Beauregard was understandably always sore that Lee was so slow to respond to him in those days in June, 1864. None of these helped his reputation. But probably worse was his bitter, bitter feuds with Jefferson Davis, culminating in the Army of Tennessee Tumulus in Metairie Cemetery. Now, this is an impressive cemetery piece. It is uh, shaped like an earthen mound, and inside of it are Confederate veterans of Louisiana, of the Army of Tennessee, buried in there. And atop the tumulus is a statue of Albert Sidney Johnston, <laughs> pointing to victory. A top fire eater. That's actually what the statue is meant to convey. It's meant to convey Johnston at the moment of victory, pointing his men forward right before he is fatally wounded. And keynote speakers include Preston Johnston, son of Albert Sidney Johnston, who wrote a biography of his father, where he takes a lot of shots at Beauregard. And he does so in his speech as well. Another speaker is Randall Lee Gibson, Beauregard's former friend, also at Shiloh, who takes more pot shots at him. But most painful of all is a short address by Jefferson Davis, who in essence says, if the man behind me had actually lived, we would have won Shiloh. And the entire time, the guy in the audience looking at them is Beauregard. They're insulting him to his face in front of the Army of Tennessee Tumulus. Oh, that was painful. And that's why when Jefferson Davis dies in 1889, and they asked Beauregard to be part of the funeral train or even lead it, which he had led many funeral trains for other Confederate veterans. He said, no, keep in mind, this is the biggest funeral in New Orleans history. Tens of thousands of people were a part of that procession. And he said, no, to paraphrase, um, I hated him and he hated me. I am no hypocrite. Sometime before that, he had said of Davis, he stinks in my nostrils. <laughs> hey, love or hate Beauregard, he will tell you what he thinks and feels, okay? So if you like honesty, go with him. So he is not part of that large funeral train. And then 1893, Beauregard dies. He is then, of course, buried in the Army of Tennessee Tumulus. He is the highest ranking Confederate buried in that tumulus. Of course, there's also an Army of Northern Virginia Tumulus nearby. It's actually larger than the Army of Tennessee one with a big pedestal with Stonewall Jackson on top. And Jefferson Davis was buried in that one at first. So for a period of time in Metairie Cemetery, they're in rival tumuluses in the same cemetery. <laughs> But they already made arrangements. They're going to move Davis's body out. Although I like to think they moved it out faster after Beauregard died. <laughs> but I think the worst irony is Beauregard's in the Army of Tennessee Tumulus, right? Who's above him? Albert Sidney Johnston. In many ways, you could say Shiloh and the death of Albert Sidney Johnston was a shadow over his life. You know, and in some ways made even worse because Beauregard actually held Johnston in some high regard, especially as a man personally. 
Um, while he kind of sourced Burgard considered himself the better commander, he always had good things to say about Johnston, the man. That actually probably had to have hurt even worse. Well, 1893, like I said, he had died. I think because of the Louisiana lottery, his reputation had already taken significant hits. The statue that once was in New Orleans, that thing took forever to raise money for, for instance. It's much easier to raise money for a statue to Robert E. Lee, for instance, which actually Beauregard helped with that. But so his reputation faded because of that. Another reason was probably because he wasn't involved. I mean, after Shiloh, he's not involved in as many big famous battles, although he's active throughout the entirety of the Civil War. If I trace this to anything, I mean, on the one hand, we have a man who is obviously talented. He won more battles than he lost. He had more success than any other commander of his rank except for Robert E. Lee. Johnston, Pemberton, Bragg, Hood, all these men failed. They lost most of their battles. Beauregard did not. He actually did win strategic victories. This doesn't make him a military genius, but I'm thinking a case that he was definitely talented, especially as an engineer in particular. And he won an impressive victory at Petersburg, cannot be denied. As a military commander deserves that. Now, some people criticize his strategic plans and say they're fanciful. And I can see that. But to defend his defensive plans, to defend his plans in one regard, they were based on his deep reading of military theory and history. They were based on concentrating forces and winning decisive battle. If I would criticize him on anything, is that he did tend to make plans where he assumed the enemy would do what he wanted them to do. That is a big defect. I give him credit on that. But, you know, we can read plans by other generals where they had based their plans on that. But I would say that Beauregard had one particular defect that always limited him through his entire life. He is bad at politics. He was bad at Louisiana politics before the war. He's bad at Louisiana politics after the war. And he was bad at politics during the Civil War. He never sent a letter to Jefferson Davis saying, these guys who don't like you, who are criticizing you, I have no part in this. I am not associated with them. He never sent that letter of reassurance. He did not play the game of politics well. And that limited him. And a lot of people will say, well, a lot of people will see that as uh, maybe a bad thing. Maybe they say you shouldn't play politics. I'd say, no, you have to. This is Grant understood that. Robert E. Lee understood that. They understood the presence they were serving. You know, Grant and Lee didn't agree with everything Lincoln and Davis were telling them. You can find lots of evidence of that. But ultimately, they're going to follow the orders that are given to them, cultivate their subordinates, and they ultimately got along well with enough people. And Beauregard, while he was very popular with most of his subordinates, He's not always popular with superiors, because remember, he thinks he is the smartest man in the room, and he oftentimes is, and that does not always make you the easiest person to work with. So if I would say there's anything that really limited what he could do, it was that personal defect of his inability to understand the politics of war in a way that these other commanders did. And that means that this is ultimately a life that, while it did have achievements and is worth studying, there is a sadness to it, a tragedy that things were not as fulfilled as they could have been. And that is ultimately why I named my book Dreams of Victory. Thank you all tonight. Can we do questions? Questions. Questions, anybody? Questions. Hey, go ahead, man. Sean, was Bolger uh, ever considered like Going through uh, about the Overland campaign, how when uh, Hill was sick and Buell wasn't effective, and they felt like he didn't have any one time Wall Street was shot. Was Beauregard ever considered by Lee to become a corps commander or help out in any capacity uh, during that time period? Yes, once Butler's contained. Not at that moment, because Butler is breaking the railroad. He's threatening Petersburg and Richmond. So Burgard has a major assignment he has to achieve. But once you have Drury's Bluff and especially Warebottom Church, yeah, within that period afterwards, Lee tries to kind of convince Beauregard to take even more forces there and bring himself as well to serve as a corps commander or a second in command. So yeah, he was definitely thinking about that, but not during Wilderness or Spotsylvania, you know. Did uh, Beauregard ever uh, threaten resignation? No, I've never run into anything in particular. Not even after Corinth when he's in disgrace and he's he's in Mobile. In fact, if anything, he really enjoyed Mobile. I mean, he's, his health's recovering. All the women are talking to him. He's having a good time. <laughs>
No, he always he, he, no, he always says he's he's like you know all things considered, at least I'm having a pleasant time here. <laughs> Also, oh, fun thing, Mobile was nicknamed Paris to the Confederacy because the blockade was so bad there. That's where you're more likely to get luxury goods, huh? yeah. <laughs> which is perfect for a guy like him. Yeah. Anybody else? I'll get you and then you. What you got? Uh, in 1861, No, no, he's getting along. They're, they're, they, they had some tension right after Bull Rum, but they're still getting along fairly well. I would say the big reason is based on the rank from the pre-war army. Remember, Albert Sidney Johnston and Lee had been colonels. Well, I think, was Lee a colonel or a lieutenant colonel? I know Johnston was a colonel. He was in command of the cavalry that got sent to uh, deal with the Mormons. So there's that that he's taking into consideration as well. Now, Joseph E. Johnston actually had a rank of brigadier general, but that was a staff rank. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, though, if I fault Davis and anyone that, it should have been flipped. It should have been Johnston 5th, Beauregard 4th. I'm sorry. He just won Bull Run. That just, that just seems like a major miscalculation. But Lee and Johnston being ahead of him, that makes some sense to me. You know, what you got over there? Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually do agree that a lot of times they might have been a bit psychosemantic, like brought on by uh, tension. So, for instance... When he's told to come north during the Bermuda 100 campaign, he at first says, I can't make it, I'm too ill. So at first, Pickett and Bushrod Johnson are the ones moving the forces around. So he's actually a little, a bit, a little bit late getting to Bermuda 100, although once he does, he's fully in command, giving the appropriate orders and everything. So I think some of that comes in. But he is genuinely in very poor health in early 1862. Although, weird thing I've run into, a lot of those Civil War generals who you read about, like, who will be in poor health during the war, man, a lot of them I find out, sometimes they look to the 20th century, like Daniel Ruggles, I mean, he looks rough, everybody talks about his bad health, I'm like, the guy lived to like 1911 or something ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, I think that was a lot of it, um, you know. And funny enough, he didn't have that many health problems after the war, I think a lot of it was tension, you know. Anybody else? Yeah, stress. Good job. Yeah. That one, I didn't mention it because I'm like, there's only so much <laughs> can of worms. <laughs> I did, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it's. I actually think the attack plan Shiloh, I think he's in a major dilemma. The one idea was to attack in columns down the road. And, of course, what Beauregard did was have them, the lines stacked up, and they come in a wave. That has a lot of defects. Units getting intermingled. Um, and also the way the attack comes, it's bringing them more towards the river instead of towards the swamp. I did eventually find, I don't think anybody cited it, but I think I found, I found the notes for Beauregard defends his attack plan. And he mentions one thing I think is particularly strong. He says, if you had attacked in columns down the road, the roads, the way, they, the way that they were, would have made that very difficult. The troops he recognized were inexperienced. They'd have to go down the road and then deploy in a line. He wanted them, when they got to the Federals, to attack right away. So I think it's a bad attack plan, but I also think that William Tecumseh Sherman was right in that regard. The terrain at Shiloh is terrible to attack through. There, I don't think there really is a good solution. So I think if he had attacked in a way that other historians have suggested, I think he would have run into a whole host of other problems. You know, So I think he just went with the solution he thought would be best and, you know, Anyway, it's, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. I'm, I'm still on the fence about it right now. You know, what's up? Yeah. The right I think they're trying to hit as fast as they can. Also, keep in mind the Bark Road goes over some very rough terrain. So you'd be marching down some very rough terrain to get over there. 
the map that one of Beauregard's engineers made of Shiloh is for the for the the, the map that both him and Johnston are using is very bad. It showed port. It showed Pittsburgh Landing being much closer to the federal camps than it actually was. And I would say the main reason is because what they're supposed to do is the morning of April fifth, Hardy's Corps, Gladden's Brigade lines up. Then you're supposed to have Bragg's Corps line up, Hulk behind them, Breckenridge behind them. I think what they're supposed to do is start attacking around 11 a.m. So I think what they were thinking is we got to strike as fast as we can because they're also thinking they're going to detect us at any moment. And a big part of this attack plan is based on the fact that Grant did not entrench. They knew this. The spies had told them that. The scouts had told them that. Bushrod Johnson, his diary, has a, says they're not entrenching, question mark. So they, they are predicated on trying to gain surprise. You know? So I think that's what it was. Is as soon as we're lined up, strike as fast as you can right into them. Okay. Oh, yeah. They definitely did. You're also talking about Chalmers Brigade, which is the best brigade in the entire army. No doubt about it. That brigade definitely wins a title high pressure for sure. Uh, but, you know, you could say maybe Beauregard should have swung the better troops out there. That's a possibility. You know, but a lot of those other men, like Polk's Corps, I'm, I don't, I don't want to like, I don't totally besmirch Polk's Corps. Those guys do some heavy fighting, right? And but Bragg and Beauregard were calling them a mob. You know, so maybe they, I mean, maybe there were some doubts about that. You know, but anyway, and also the, the other half of Bragg's Corps, keep in mind, is Ruggles Division, which is a lot. Of that's Louisiana militia. You know, don't want to besmirch them either. But these, once again, are the kind of guys you'd be swinging out. But maybe you could have done it. Once again, it's Chalmers Brigade. You just mentioned the best they have. <laughs> Oh yeah. Why not the five Yeah. Once again, I think they're trying to get the surprise, man. I think that's what it is. Yeah, and the map's bad. That's a terrible map. It's a, it's a terrible map. I'm gonna put the map in the book so everybody can see just how bad this map is. Okay. Because <laughs> when you look at it, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Not quite as much because Longstreet was a Republican, Beauregard was a Democrat the entire time, you know. Um, and keep in mind, too, that uh, his main objective during Reconstruction is how do I hurt the Republican Party? Uh, one of my favorite lines that ran to his one of his letters is, I hope we can get a lot of the freedmen to vote Democrat. That way the Republicans can, this is what he says, drink from the poisoned chalice. He absolutely hates the Republican Party. And Longstreet has sided the Republicans. So that helped him out. What really hurt him post-war was the Louis, with Southern's Louisiana lottery, you know. But yeah, I think, I mean, he didn't, uh, no, he was not hobnobbing with Republicans, you know. In fact, he was a member of the Metairie Jockey Club, which was Democrat only. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? All right, guys, thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will see you next. When we are going to learn about our two all the way, call us if you free <laughs> from Nashville if you are a Confederate or call us if you shoot after Nashville if you are a follower of the Union. And that will be our program uh, next month for the uh, my last meeting as president. <laughs> uh, we'll see you then.